So good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for coming to the weird talk of the conference. Um, so I want to, who knows what social environmentalism is? Two, okay, great. Nobody else? Yes, that's the point. So I'm here to tell you what I think social environmentalism is. Um, and I'd be very interested to know uh, about your feedback at the end of it. So, but to obviously this is a metaphor. So to start the to start the conversation, let's start from the real world environmentalism meaning. And to this point, I want to talk about briefly about uh, the latest, one of the latest uh, talks from Mel Boer at TED 2016, where he basically presented the case of the current state in, in climate crisis. And so he had a couple of, two, three parts actually. But in the first part, he basically said we are kind of doomed, right? So we are producing fossil fuels an exponential growth and we are we have no we show no stop no sign of stopping right so that's a terrible thing but actually that's not the terrible thing the terrible thing is that we are producing more fossil fuels than we are able to burn so to the point in which right now climate crisis uh, is being considered the number one threat to the economy to the global economy so that's a fascinating thing i think um, so what he was saying, as I said, uh, is that the amounts of things, these are the amounts of things that we have um, burned or uh, created, the carbon that we have created, and only this is the amount of carbon that we were able to burn. Which basically means that we have this offset of things, carbon, that is left there, we are creating it, and we are unable to burn it. It's unburnable carbon mass. And that is actually the problem. Now. That, you know, you listen to this one, it's like, whoa, we are doomed. But the thing is that there are actually signs of improvement, but these signs are very, very curious. So the way they look, they look like this. Interestingly, they look, the signs of improvement also look like an exponential curve. The in, in this case, the exponential curve is about the adoption of the alternative uh, energy sources, right? So these ones are growing exponentially. Now, why do these, this is, for example, wind, why do they grow exponentially? Because the cost is going down. And that's a fascinating thing. And it supplies even stronger to solar power. Now, but the interesting thing, at some point, he's saying, well, notice how this curve goes up at a certain amount of point here, and he actually points to this one. And he says, 10 years ago, when he was first at TED talking about climate crisis, that was the point. This was the inflection point over there. Now, what happened 10 years ago? Now that, to me, is really interesting. What turned this thing, which looked like it's a doom thing, into something that is actually solvable? So if you go back to that talk from 10 years ago, he actually lists a couple of things. And at that point, we were just, you know, nobody knew exactly what to do. But he gives at least two points, which I think were really, really relevant afterwards. And point number 14 that he was saying was like things to do, basically, projections. He was basically calling for people to increase the uh, awareness on the problem. He wanted to, uh, he wanted to get people to convince other people that this is a real problem. And the other thing was that this whole you know, convincing the other ones uh, started from actually giving the problem a name. Because up to that point, the problem didn't really have a proper name by which to propagate. And he gave this name, right? He gave climate crisis. And actually, he was actually asking for feedback, is this a good name or not? This was 10 years ago. So 10 years ago, we people were not even decided how to call this problem. And within this amount of time, we can turn this problem upside down by creating this as a solution. Completely unpredictable. And we actually blew all predictions, all the most optimistic predictions uh, were blown away, uh, basically, by the what, ha what actually happened in reality to solve this problem. Once consciousness, uh, once we had a conscious subjectal conversation around this problem, we, as the global community, managed to start or start to be able to find solutions that are were otherwise completely unpredictable. Okay, so what does it have to do with software? Well, <laughs> the thing is, I started, I once very recently, not too long ago, I stumbled across this paper. 
It's called compound annual growth rate for software. It's in appear in I2Poly software. Um, anybody knows what compound annual growth rate is? No? So, um, no, I mean, what it is. <laughs> so what it is is basically how something grows year over year, right? So you have something and then the next year is how much. Um, so what they said was that they, look some, uh, they looked at some systems and then, that's interesting over here, the compound annual growth rate for software for these systems that they looked at said range somewhere between 11% and 29% um, growth per year. Now just to put it in perspective, um, a 15% 15, 15 growth per year means doubling size every five years. Okay, that's an exponential growth. A size of software, s a source code. Okay, see, so they looked at some some systems in the in the wild. They picked them randomly, apparently, and then they looked at this. So, I wanted to see: is this really true? I don't know. So I picked a couple of systems too. So I went to um, to Open Hub, and so here's Chromium, um, 20 million lines of code, double size in the last three years. Here's IntelliJ Idea Community Edition, double size in the last two years. Here's Elasticsearch, double size in the last three years. Here's M MySQL, double the size in the last four years. Here's Mercurial, now small things, double the size in the last four or five years. And now let's what about very large things, right? Linux, double the size in the last five, five years. So this is fascinating. We seem to accumulate things that somewhat at least continuous growth. Some indication saying exponential growth. We are accumulating software code at some sort of an exponential growth rate. So, you know, so what, right? As long as we are able, if we would have been able to burn the carbon that we are emitting, nobody would actually care about climate crisis because it wouldn't be an issue. And then I remembered a paper, an older paper, you know, remember the year 2K problem? Anybody? Right? Yeah, that was a fascinating problem. It was like the, the coolest problem that the reverse engineering community had and didn't manage to tap on. Right? All right? Um, so, you know, and that during that time, one thing that happened during that time was that people actually went, business people had the interest of actually going and looking at their software systems and treating them as if it would be inventory. Okay, which is actually not a, not a bad thing to have, to look at your software system and consider it as an asset. So one thing they noticed was this little thing here. ID, uh, this is a paper from around 2000. IDC estimates that there are more than 10,000 large ma IBM mainframe systems still in use. I have no idea how many small uh, IBM mainframe systems were still in use, but 10,000 mainframe large mainframe systems still in use, totaling 200 billion lines of code. Now, that's for me the troubling part. Because on the one hand, we're creating software faster and faster. But on the other hand, we seem to be unable to get rid of old systems. Now, perhaps, I mean, why should we get rid of the old system, right? Why, why, would, why should we bother if it works? Well, for one, we have the Lemon's Law. Remember that one? That if you don't change your system, it will uh, eventually become irrelevant. So on the one hand, you need to go and maintain and get that system to run, and not just to keep it running, but actually adapt it to whatever new requirements you have. But there is actually a little bit more than that. So I'll tell you two anecdotes. And again, these I heard these ones from second sources. but. On the other hand, I heard multiple of these things, and I'll let you decide whether there is some truth to it. So the first one goes like this. An insurance company has a mainframe system. Their processor seems to um, you know, not work well anymore. They were looking for a replacement processor, and ob obviously nobody would make those replacement processors, and they found one in a museum in the United States. So now think about this. This is an insurance company, and they understand risk. And the core system they're having is crashing underneath them. 
there's obviously an interest to move away from that predicament. But somehow, we were unable to do it, or the people there were unable to execute on it. But then I tell you another story. And another story is that a, a railway company um, has a processor that is kind of failing. They're going looking for one. And they find one, they found one on a, on a secondary market, you know, at an eBay-like auction site. The problem was that there was another bidder. And there was a nuclear power plant. The problem was that the nuclear power plant is, you know, 40 kilometers away from where I live. These things are real. The impact, we have a footprint. It's not that we don't want to get rid of old systems. We somehow are unable to do it. And I think we owe it to ourselves to actually go and understand why is it that we are unable to do so. So let me quickly introduce myself. My name is Tudor Gilba. I work at, uh, uh, I'm a software environmentalist at, uh, at a company that um, I co-founded. So I can name myself the way I want. Um, but when I people ask me what do I do for a living, I, I tell them that I do this. Who finds it strange? Anybody find this strange? And I earned my living doing that, so. Hmm? Not, not strange, 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 but uh, you know, teaching developers how not to read code. Now let's think about this. Um, so would you agree if I say the developers read code for about 50% of their time? Yes, anybody? Yeah, so it's, there's quite strong agreement. I actually asked 2,000 developers this year alone this question. And there is 90 plus percent agreement that this is happening to at least 50 percent of the uh, uh, at least 50 percent of their time, if not more. So about 25 percent of them say that it's actually more than 50 percent of their time. But then here's the other thing: I also asked these 22,000 people. I asked them, when was the last time you talked about how you read code? Have you heard developers talk about how they read code? No, nobody talks about how we read code. But this is awkward because reading is, this is what it means. You know, I have a piece of text. I just took a, a small system, 250,000 lines of code. I put it all in one file and I'm just reading through it. But when I say reading, I'm actually paging down through this whole thing. So here's the little problem, okay? That scroll bar over there, that's the problem. This thing doesn't scale at all, right? So, but then there is a little bit of another problem. You see, when we are looking at programming or you know, development, we look at it as a whole, and we only consider the active part of building, right? We don't have it, we develop it, and then we have it, and that's so cool, because this actually allowed us to go and penetrate or you know, reach every possible industry out there. And this expansion is just growing further and further and further. And in fact, everything that we are building from now on has software at its foundation. We're at the very core of what's going on in the, in, you know, in the next, I don't know how many years. Whatever we do now is going to influence that future dramatically. So the only problem here you know, if you 50% of your time, you're actually not building something, it basically means that if you're only talking about how you build, you're not talking about 50% of your business. 50% of the overall software development business is being spent on something, on one single activity about which nobody ever talks about. This is the single largest, most expensive expenditure we have, and nobody talks about it. So I think we should talk about it. Would you agree? Of course you should, because otherwise we end up the talk. Um, <laughs> but if we do talk about it, um, you know, we'll realize that actually nobody wants to read code. People want to make decisions. They have a problem, they want to go and reason about it, make a decision, and then affect the future of that system. That's the goal of reading. Very few people actually want to read. Sometimes you want to, but in the ma vast majority of cases, people just want to make the decision, understand what to do next. 
which basically means that reading is just a way in which you achieve this little thing, right? But if reading is a way, perhaps there is another way. It's a consequence of that. But you will never find it if you don't have a name. Now the problem is, as I said, people are still calling this um, as code reading, but actually they don't talk about it at all, and I say it's like with Voldemort. You know, that, that must not be named. The problem is that if you don't give it a name, you don't know how to fight it. So I'm giving it a name, I'm not calling it analysis, I'm not calling it analytics, I'm calling it assessment. And for me, assessment is the discipline of understanding a situation, and this is the important part, with the goal of actually making a decision. That's the only thing. And I'm only interested, how do I go from this situation to the decision? I'm not interested in the overall understanding. So I want to give you an example. So the way I do it, I go with and interact with developers, and I give them a, a very simple problem. So imagine you have a Java system. Uh, let's say somewhere around 2,000 lines of code, the, the Java system that I scroll through. And I tell them that the in that Java system, there are 25 deprecated classes and they should now estimate the amount of time they need to reason about what should they do with these 25 classes. It's a simple problem, right? So ideally, you know, you're marking something as deprecated so that with the goal of, of deleting it in the near future or s at some time in the future, correct? So imagine that you're sometime in the future and now you need to say which ones of these can I delete and of those that I cannot delete, what do I do about them? And I ask them, you know, to, to first of all to say what, how would you reason about this and imagine using a tool. And when they, s when they describe the tool that they use, they describe it in terms of, you know, clicking. You know, in maybe in Eclipse, you're doing a regular text search, so looking for star, deprecated star. Um, obviously, this also gives you false positives because deprecated can be uh, also applied to attributes and methods. So anyway, and then let's say imagine that you actually get to the 25 list, uh, 25 element list. So then they click on the first one, they right click on it, and then they say, look at references, if the references are empty, then I can go and delete this thing. But if you can't, and if it's not empty, then I have to go and look for references of references because if all the references are deprecated and so on, right? If you count the whole, th the whole thing, it's basically, it amounts to two, 300 uh, clicks. When I ask people to estimate how long do they think they need uh, to go and do this clicking around, they actually, they, their estimations come somewhere between four hours and two days. This is when, say, just to make sure, they want to be sure that what they're doing is like this. And then I'm giving them a, a demo. So I'll be showing you now a demo. This demo, in this case, is going to be using Moose technology. Um, it's just, it's an open source project. A anybody heard of it? Okay, so I'm not going to describe it too much. Um, so I'll take this problem. So here's my system. I loaded it in. I select my classes, and now obviously um, I want to do a query, right? So I'll do, I'll select those classes that are annotated with uh, deprecated. And now I'm executing this one, and I get the result of 25 classes. And obviously of these ones, I'm only interested in those classes that have no uh, client types. That is nothing you know, refers to me. So these are about 14 of them. I have 14 classes that I can just delete right now. Obviously this leaves me with those that I cannot delete, which are 11 of them. So up to now, right, I've just solved the first problem, which ones of, the, uh, of those I can delete. Now I have the rest of it. The question there is, what do I do with these ones? Because I still have to rank this list somehow, because otherwise it's like, you know, playing a lotto. So maybe I'm, I will hit a lucky one and maybe not. So let's reason about this little problem a bit. So to do this, I, I want to create a visualization. Um, so I will say, I want to look at these classes. I'll first create the visualization, which is an empty object at the moment. And then I'll say, well, I want to look at these classes, the self, these 11 things. And I want to also look at all the client types of these of these 11 things. And I'll just want them at one single time, so I want to have no duplicates. So if I execute this, I get my, uh, my preview over there. Let's maybe choose a different thing. So if I'm now having this, now what's this? Is this a box? 
So now it's not a box, it's a class, right? So if I click on that, I get details, for example, source code or internal representation, right? So I can go and navigate things like this. Fine, but I'm still not ready. So let's go back here. Now I want to distinguish between those uh, shapes that um, are deprecated. Each is annotated with deprecated and I should maybe use color red, right? Oh, I should say the shape should be a circle, right? So now I have a circle shape and so now I distinguish between those that are deprecated are red and those that are not deprecated are gray. So let's quickly also put their um, edges. So I'll create the edges and I'll say, well, connect from all client types. Right, so now I have the edges there. Fine, let's now say slightly differently. So now I basically I create a force space layout. So what I see here is that I have some, some classes, some deprecated classes that are being tightly connected to other users, which is probably going to be likely that those kinds of classes will be harder to remove. I also have things that are very cheap, right? Those two cluster of de deprecated classes, I can just boom, delete it all together. So, but I can also go a step deeper. For example, as up to now, it's just this is just a generic, uh, just a generic analysis. I, I can just apply it on any, on any Java system. But I can also take advantage of what I know about this system. For example, in this system, it's a simple desktop application. So it has a UI and has a non-UI uh, part. So if I want to now refactor, clean up my system, I'll probably want to favor the non-UI part first and then the UI part. So let's quickly distinguish between those parts now. So if I'm here, I say, well, if, um, it m if something matches a star UI star, kind of um, name, if it does not do that, then let's say I want to say border color blue. So if I'm executing this, what do I see? I actually reduce my problem even further. This is the only interesting part, this and that one. So even within the scope of this little problem, if I look back at what happened here, I started from 2,385 classes. In a matter of minutes, I reduced my problem to one, two, three, four, five classes that are worthy of doing something with. So what happens now? It's at this moment that I really want to invest my eyes into actually reading. So for example, maybe I will pick the one here, the leaf, and then I will start reading this. But that's the moment when I want to read. So you see this problem, it's a typical problem. Now the problem is, from here to here, this is not a reading problem. It's a search problem. So when we talk about the, the largest expense we have in software development, we're spending probably 90% of it in the wrong way. So, that being said, I have a little other problem uh, with the code reading. So the problem there is the following. You see, when I look at the interface that people are, the developers are really exposed to, really, like if you take away the bells and whistles, which are there for very often for decoration purposes, um, you are left with a giant text editor, right? So the larger the monitor it is, um, you know, sometimes, did you notice some people putting the monitors on the vertical just so that they can have a longer text editor, right? That's, that's the sign, right? People actually want more context, but the problem, um, the, other the next problem with it, besides being very slow, the next problem with it is that this thing shows you 50 lines at a time if you're lucky. Now 50 lines, of the 50 lines out of 250,000 lines of code, which is not even a large system, um, it's like saying, well, I will hire you to build me a city and I'll give you one tool, and that's the magnifier glass. Well, it's perfect for people that want to do fine-grade restoration. It's absolutely terrible to expect a cohesive result out of this, right? This is perfect for details. By the way, isn't it fascinating how we're doing actually the reading in an editor? Um, but there is another problem. The other problem with this, and I think this is really the, the, the most important problem. 
the, the other problem with this interface is that it, it, it tells me that I'm in control. When I look at this file, I know, or at this class, I know that it starts there, it has this structure, and it ends somewhere there. I'm in control. It's encapsulated. I'm in control. I look at this representation, I also feel in control, of course, uh, because, I mean, I created a cage, I put it in the cage, and I said, well, look, you see, it's in control. Uh, that's the shape of it. But let's look at this same class from a slightly different perspective. So here's my class with black, and then the methods are red, and the attributes are blue, and then I'm just drawing connections with them. So if a method calls each uh, another method, there's going to be an edge, and if a method belongs to a class, there's going to be an edge, and like that. And I'm just using a force space layout there to just cluster the whole thing. So if I look at this in isolation, it's, it's the shape is very well defined. What happens if I put some um, neighbors to the class? The shape, you know, it's that, that initial shape somehow starts to degrade a little bit. What happens if I put more neighbors to that class? I don't recognize my class anymore. And what happens if I put the whole system in there? Again, that class doesn't exist anymore. The problem is, right, if you zoom out, the problem is that context is an imp the most important thing we have in software, but our interface never exposes it to us, uh, never exposes that, that context to us. We have to have it in our head. I think that's not appropriate for humans. It's asking too much of us. There's a limit that we cannot bear. And that's why when I'm also asking people, I'm asking them, do you enjoy working with legacy systems? And nobody enjoys it. In fact, people actively dislike working with legacy systems. Chad Fowler, um, not too long ago, he noticed that software is the only discipline in which legacy has a bad connotation. The word legacy. And that's true. We are supposed to have the coolest job on the planet. And we are miserable for most of our time. It doesn't make sense. By the way, was the previous session that I showed you, was it cool? Now, isn't it amazing? Can we, what would happen if we would transform that boring, terrible um, experience of working with a legacy system into something that is actually, literally cool and productive? And when I say productive, I'm talking at least an order of magnitude more productive. What would happen? Maybe not so bad things. But the other thing is, when people are looking at, at this, you know, at software, right, we people say, well, you know, if you're not going to test the software well enough, and this is already a problem, um, you're going to need to test it. And we've seen some of these things, right? We, uh, we first started about testing, now we're doing random testing, and then we want also want to do Soup verification and then deep verification, phenomenal things. But here's the thing, I think that's not enough. Um, so let me tell you the story of this little system. This is actually a super tiny system. It was a system given to uh, students for about, um, I don't know, I think it was, yeah, a team of four students for six weeks building a very small a Android application. A very strictly, th the interesting thing here was that they were given the stack, the whole stack. They, they couldn't choose the library. They were given everything. The only thing they could do was choose the implementation there, right? So the way they would um, design their classes. That was the only thing they could do. And they were tested from a requirements point of view. So they were tested from a functional point of view. Nothing interesting. It's a, it's a very, very boring application. Here's the interesting thing. That application over there does exactly the same thing. Exercise from a functional point of view, both of these things produce the same value. Internally, they look radically different. If you're only constraining functionality, that's absolutely not enough. So then we repeated this one with three teams, we repeated it with extra two teams, and then we repeated it with multiple teams in parallel. And all of this, all the time, it happened that there was no repeatable uh, solution. For only for those constraints was not enough. And the reason is, the other thing that we learned from this is that software has an emergent structure. And this is just structure. We didn't take into account configuration. We didn't take into account logs. We didn't take into account, uh, you know, runtime, performance, security, all of those. We did not take it those into account, just pure structure. And even here, we have this super duper um, variability. Yeah.
So the question is, what do I think about the influence of language design that would influence the way you would control or not control this complexity? So first of all, I think language is not enough. If you're just looking at programming language, that's not enough. We have to at least look at tools. I'll explain what I mean in a second. Um, second of all, I think constraints are totally not used in, in industry. And this community over here knows a lot about constraints. And that, that information should be disseminated to the industry. And how those constraints are being uh, captured, whether this is in your programming language or in some sort of an external, uh, in an external checker, um, yes, that's a debate and that's a point of discussion. So I'm not here to actually tell you what the recipe is. My goal is to phrase, to frame a problem. Because here's the problem. It's not that we don't know, we haven't done any analysis in the last 30 years. In fact, there's a whole, actually there's more domains that address that space. But the problem is we are still starting, pay 30 years later, we are still starting papers saying developers spend 50% of their time reading code. So my question is, what's the impact? And what's the impact in the real world? We were supposed to research such that we can advance stuff that happens in reality. And I think at the very least it should worry us that some things ha perhaps have gone amiss. So, but let's go back to this problem. Now, if I look at this one, let's imagine, because maybe this defines me a space of different possible solutions, right? I could basically be anywhere, right? I could, for example, be here. Now, let's imagine that I, ha I you know, because I'm just, I'm a manager and I just read in a magazine about microservices, so I should now go and split my system into two, right? I should go and take a chainsaw and boom, I will cut it there. And it kind of would work in this particular system, right? But uh, maybe I'm here. Well, okay, it will cost me a little bit more money, but okay, it's gonna, it's gonna happen at some point. But what if I'm there? And that's a problem. This is a recurrent problem that you'll see over and over again in reality, because the first thing that people don't know is what we have. Before you can choose what to do next, before you can take an existing system and refurbish it for different purposes, adapt it, cut it, or you know, throw it away altogether. Before you can do that, before you can take a system apart, you first have to understand the parts. But if my, my ability to understand the parts depends on my manual capability of going through that system, then I have a fundamental problem there. Because I'm trying to match an exponential curve with something that is fundamentally capped in speed. And this is a problem of monumental proportions right now. The only the main reason why I believe we are actually not seeing it the effects at this very moment is because we are still able to throw an exponentially more amount of developers at the problem. But we are going to soon <laughs> end that pool that is lying there. And the problem, you know, as, as it happens with exponential things, um, they have the, the, this little thing of, of kicking you faster than you actually think. And that's why I think we have a fundamental, a significant problem. So, by the way, um, a real system maybe looks like this. Now, people look at this and say, wow, that's messy. But I look at it and I say, wow, that's beautiful. <laughs> because it is beautiful. But only, only if I, if I am, if I know how to look and distinguish the beauty, only then does it become beautiful. And for a long time, we had no idea how to dig information out of that space. We didn't know how to do it. That's why all that research that actually had been spent in the last at least three decades is incredibly valuable. And we need to move that knowledge into the real world because that can actually literally transform everything, everything, the everything we do about our software systems. So the way I look at, this, at the software system, I see three lenses. 
And those answers, they basically look like this. If this is what I want the system to look like, and maybe that's the interface of it, whatever that interface is. And then typically this is how the implementation looks like. Now the interesting thing is that all these three figures uh, share the same three points. You might see the three points in the interface, but you are gonna have a harder time finding them in the real implementation. That's a little bit of a problem. Now, but think about it, because it used to be a time when, actually with when software systems were a pain to use. You remember that time? Right? Sometimes even now, but it's much better. Now, I just realized, I uh, like, not too long ago, last year, I think, I changed banks, and then I realized that I just, you know, I made a payment, and I didn't feel terrible. Like, I used the online banking, and I made a payment, and I didn't feel terrible. And I think, wow, isn't that an achievement? Because it is, right? Now, how did we come to that achievement? Well, we made this a subject of conversation. We said, well, there are people that live over here, and we have to look at this problem such that these people are going to be comfortable working with these systems. That's how we changed that game. But here's the thing, there are people that live over there. And I think we have to frame the problem such that we can optimize this space such that they are more comfortable living there. Now here in this space, we use the term usability. Here right now, we're talking about technical debt, which is an absolutely, it was a beautiful metaphor 25 years ago, um, but it's absolutely bankrupting us right now. Here's why, technical debt, is a phenomenal metaphor, but it's a negative one. I mean, the best case scenario um, is that nothing bad happens. It's like me like meeting a policeman. But you can't be in a, ha you can't live in, a, if a policeman stops you, you can't live in a happier state than when, you know, than you were prior to the policeman stopping you, right? So that's a negative proposition. The best case scenario is that you're not unhappy. But that's not good enough. Why are we not reaching for happiness? You know, putting a smile on a developer's face every day. Why not? I mean, I maybe we could run like a, you know, like a, have a political um, campaign on, uh, around that slogan. But, but the point is that there is this concept, and I love it. It's called habitability. And the idea there is that we are coined by by um, Richard Gabriel and. The cool thing about that, it says, it starts from the premise that we are actually spending most of our active life inside an a inside a software system, which should follow that it makes perfect sense for us to make that software system suitable for human inhabitants, right? And so if we do that, how could we do that? What kind of characteristics should we have in that environment such that these we actually reach that capability, that characteristic? So. And let's, so let's talk about these people. Now, a typical situation, you know, when you're working teams of people working on a project, they typically look, you know, uh, they, they, they work on a, on, a, uh, on a project, but the thing is that they are, they are frustrated. So in order to change this one, I would like to coin a principle. It's a proposition. And the principle for me says that those people have the right to build upon recyclable systems. And they also have the responsibility of producing uh, recyclable systems. Now what do I mean by recyclability? What is recyclability? Recyclability is saying I take something, I take it apart, maybe change a little bit, maybe change it more, maybe throw it all together such that I adopt or, accom or accommodate new needs. This is what happens every day when I go from one version to another version. Yes, go ahead. Y well, you just did. <laughs> right. You have to take the system apart first. Yeah, but that's the first thing. That's the first thing. But, so, first of all, let's get something right, because we have a metaphor here, and now, you know, metaphors, they work as far as they work, and then they break down. So I don't like this one. I talk, I say it's like this, right? I talk about developers um, having the 
they have the right to build upon a testable system. It should be easy for them to go from something that they've never seen before to understanding in a matter of minutes. And they also have the responsibility of producing something that carries that property over. And the question is, how do we reach that thing? So let's, look a let's take a look at our typical system. Right? A typical system is like something that just put together, I take it from here, download it from the other one, NPM, and blah, 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 and boom, I have this one over, right? Um, so the thing here is, the question is, what happens once I get a bug here? You know, two years, the first two years are fine, but afterwards the problems start to kick in. And you get a problem there. How do you deal with that problem? Are you ready to deal with that problem? When you pick that block, did you pick it such that you optimize for this problem? Because this is where the pain actually is. And we have to optimize for this space. And the only way, the thing here is that we are looking at, at a software system and we are looking at through the lenses of the tools we have and that tool is showing us text so we see text. But just because we enter text, it doesn't mean that that's the natural shape of a software system. Software systems have no shape. Better yet, they can have any shape. The only thing, the only way we give shape to a system is through the tools. And those tools are essential. And we need to have a conversation about people and tools. We can't just leave it about, you know, programming languages. This is not enough. We need the tools involved into that conversation too. So let's talk about this uh, for a little second. And you know, in the previous century, there was a there was a philosopher who was also quoted in the in the keynote this morning, and he was his name was Marshall McLuhan, right? And he looked at how um, the TV and radio were massively introduced into the American culture, and the question was, what's the impact onto the culture? And the impact was massive. And he coined this law, saying that we shape our tools, and thereafter our tools shape us. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means, if this is true, it means that we should be very picky with the characteristics of the tools that we expose ourselves to because they will determine the way we're going to think about the problem, right? Now, perhaps that's a little bit too abstract, so let me give you an example. Have you seen slides that look like this, right? Now, here's the thing. We know that this is not the best way to transmit information. In fact, we know that actually they are counterproductive. But so then why such a widespread behavior of actually using slides like this? Why so? Now, I don't know exactly why, so I can't prove the, co the, the causation, but there is a very interesting correlation to that template. Isn't it? Now, let's go to something maybe that is closer to home. If I take a developer and I give, I give the developer a million rows in the database, and they say there's a problem there. The first thing the developer does is to write a query. The first thing. If you give the same developer a million lines of code and say there's a problem there, the developer starts scrolling. The two problems are absolutely identical in nature. Why the different behavior? Now again, I can't prove causation, but isn't it fascinating to notice the correlation of how this a typical database uh, interface looks like? A query box and a data box and how an IDE looks like. Do you notice the missing query box? Of course, and then people say, yeah, but developers are unable to write queries. The same developer that is able to write absolutely complicated query about user's data is unable to write simple queries. No. We, can, we cannot have this conversation without considering the characteristics of our tools. Those are essential. So. And the way I think about it, the way these tools fit into this scheme, I look at it like this. I think we should start from a hypothesis, and then you apply a tool, an analysis, and you get the results. And if you're confident, then you act. If you're not, then you repeat, which is nothing else but the scientific method. But I'm saying we should apply this thing to absolutely every individual engineering problem. Now, the only way, there's only one tiny problem. The tiny problem is that the problems that people have are incredibly contextual, which means that they can't be predicted from the outside, which means that I cannot give you a ready-made clicking tool. So the question, there's only one tiny question that you have to ask, do I have a tool? And if I don't have a tool, I should build one. 
And that, to me, I think is absolutely essential in software engineering. So I call this, I built a little method which is called humane assessment. But, you know, rather than telling you in abstract what it means, um, let me tell you an example. So a very typical case is when people have, um, uh, when people have a, a, a module, let's say, that they need to split away, right? So here's, I have a thousand functions here in a module that, I, that we need to split it away, right? We split it apart. The question was, how do we do that? Well, one possible way of thinking about it is to say, well, let's look at how cohesive it is, right? Let's look at the interconnections, and we say this is a very sparse graph. It's there's no cohesion there, which basically means that looking at this as an indicator of how to split it apart is not a good thing. So what else? Well, another way of looking at it is to say, well, let's reason about the same thing, but from a user point of view. Right, so from a client of this module point of view. So if I put a client there, that's the client in red, and these are now how the clients are using my functions. We, I can see how which functions are you know, um, clustering around my client. So if I add some more, I notice that, okay, this function is being used by two of them, some more there, and I put some, a couple of them. Now I notice that most of, this, of the functions are being occupied by these typical clients. And if I now take a look into, if I take into account now the inner calls, I notice that most of it now is they are being, you know, part of this picture. But I also see this very, very strong correlation between the functions and the clients, which basically indicates it's a very nice, it's a probably, it's a best, it's a good way to split that module apart. Basically, take this function, put it closer to the clients. Did it make sense to you? Now, here's the thing. You, we just reason about 50,000 lines of code in two minutes. And we have reached a common conclusion. Isn't that the basis of how groups and teams are working together? That they first need to understand what they are talking about. Now, how did we reach that conclusion? We reached it by, created, by creating a custom tool. A tool that tells the story of this individual problem. And so the only thing there is, the question here is, how much does a, cool like a tool like this cost? Because if it can cost nothing, or almost nothing, we can disrupt the way we think about existing software systems. And so talking about the cost of this one, that's actually the cost. Now here's what it is. Notice the missing scroll bar over here. So this is what we do around Moose. What we do with Moose is to show we can actually approach tool building like you approach a programming language. There is a meta model for those tools, for each of those things. And there's nothing, we're just talking about the transformation. Tools are just an extension of programming languages. That's it. There, 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 there is nothing intrinsic in them that makes them expensive. It's the opposite. Tools can actually be created Fancy tools, smart tools, beautiful tools can be created in a matter of minutes. Not all of them, but I think that's a worthy goal to have uh, from a research point of view. Now, the other thing is that um, when you look at a typical you know, user interface, a picture tells a thousand words. I just use pictures to communicate with you. Why are we seeing this all the time? And these tools are incredibly rigid. For example, here I'm just looking, I just put a break, we're looking at a, at a dictionary or a map. And I'm seeing a tree. Why am I seeing a tree when I'm looking at a map? I should see a table because that's what I'm looking at, at the very least. Why am I not able to bend these tools? I think we should be able to do it. So that's um, the little project that we are doing around this glamorous toolkit. So what we have done is we re and reshaped the, the IDE so that we can actually play with each individual object, like I have done with source code. It can be about runtime data, data in the database, anything can have its own view. So what we have done, we have put it out there. So here's in, so the camera circuit is implemented in Faro. So here's a space of one core image. So we have here packages and uh, each bubble here is a class. And here are all the extensions. All of these classes have at least one custom view associated to them created by somebody that had a need to do it. Once we had decreased the cost of building the tool, 
once we, we transform the problem from here to here. And this basically opened up adoption at a very, very steep rate. We're also seeing an exponential curve at the adoption of custom-made tools that help us take our system apart. That's what I understand by this little problem. I think it's absolutely the largest problem we have. It's not the most important problem we have. It's the most basic problem we have. And right now, we're not talking about it. And I think there's lots to talk about. And you, you have a lot to contribute. But first, we have to give it a name. Thank you very much. What is component-based software engineering?